Grateful, grateful, grateful. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, I want to begin, I believe this will be a series entitled The Mature Believer. The Mature Believer. Uh, the object of the Christian life is maturity. It's to grow up. All right? And uh, I heard a man of God, actually it was Bob Yandian, said that years ago. He said it when he was here in the church. And he said, the object of the Christian life is maturity. And that, that just imprinted my spirit. Well, but when, when that statement is made, then I've got to ask myself, according to Scripture, what constitutes a mature believer? What does the Spirit say denotes a mature believer? If, if, if I'm looking for maturity, what does Scripture say is the evidences of me being mature? All right, because, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, when I was a boy growing up in school, ninth graders didn't have full beards. <laughs> Nowadays we do, you know. I was always kind of, kind of, you know, put out when I'd get around Wyatt. You know, he was in eighth grade and had a full beard. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, I just kind of made sure I stayed clean shaven all the time. <laughs> Glory to God. But, but here, here's my point. This is not an indication, in, in, uh, obviously an indication uh, uh, concerning Wyatt. But you can see somebody, right, that's 16 and they got a full beard, but they're not mature. Because a full beard doesn't denote maturity. Maybe good genetics. But not maturity. Is, is, is that right? right. Amen. And, and, so, and so you might see somebody, you might see a child uh, that is in the sixth grade, but they look like they're 18. But they're not mature. You, you follow me? So there's got to be some indicators. What's the indicators of are they mature? How do they respond to things? What's their mindset about things? How, how, do they, how do they think about things? Have you ever been around somebody that uh, uh, in, in age they, they should have been mature, but they weren't mature? They were immature where money was concerned, they, right? They, they, and, and, and your mindset was, well, in that area, they just need to what? Grow up. Amen. So the object of the Christian life is maturity. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he, Jesus, gave some apostles and some prophets, some, pa some uh, uh, evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ until, all right, this is his intention, until we all come in the unity or into the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or a mature man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, we'll hold on right here. We'll read some more. But it says, until we all come, until we all arrive in this place of unity of the faith. So what is that telling us? That one day we'll arrive there. Right? Because those gifts are in the church until that point, until that time. And notice, until... Under the, and, and of the faith and of the knowledge, we could say, and until we all come into the knowledge of the Son of God, until we all come unto, or we all become perfect or mature, right? Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That word stature means age, until the age of the fullness of Christ. That we be no more children, Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the sight of men cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, notice, speaking the truth, being sincere, in love, we may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. The Woos Bible says, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the experiential full and precise knowledge of the Son of God to a spiritually mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ, in order that we be no more immature ones, 
tossed to and fro, carried around in circles by every wind of teaching and the cunning craftiness of men, in craftiness which furthers the scheming, deceitful art of error, but speaking the truth in love, notice this phrase, may grow up into him in all things who is the head, Christ. So we see this phrase over and over again in the scripture, a spiritually mature man, grow up into him in all things, all right? So the purpose of the ministry gifts is to perfect or mature the body of Christ. Now, that's, I'm not focused on the ministry gifts as much as I am the maturity, all right? The, the purpose of the ministry gifts, every one of them, according to scripture, is to bring a level of maturity to the body of Christ. Now, obviously, the bulk of that responsibility falls on the pastor, all right, to bring people to a place of maturity, to grow them up into the things of God. Paul said in the book of Colossians that his job was to present that church mature to Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm growing. So the purpose of the ministry gifts is to perfect or mature the body of Christ. And, and, and we'll talk about this more as we go on in this message. But the church, the local church, the church is a family. The job of a parent is not just to provide for a child, but we could say it this way, raise a child. Raise them into maturity. Prepare them for life, right? Raise a mature child. That's the job of a parent. That's, that's the job of the ministry gift in the local church, is to raise people up to the place where they're walking in maturity. You understand? The word perfecting means to complete furnishing or equipping. To complete furnishing or equipping. So again, we see this picture in the raising of natural children. The parent's job is to equip their child. Right? To, to set them down at some point and equip them with the knowledge that they're going to need. What, whatever it may be. Right? I mean, we, we, we all know what knowledge is going to be needed. So, so we, we, we start giving our child an allowance, and at some point we set them down, and we talk to them about budgeting. We talk to them, obviously, about tithing. We, right, we're equipping them. And then when they go and they go out into their life, they're not going out there with no understanding and no knowledge about how things work. Because they're what? Equipped. They're furnished. Amen. Amen. So the parent's job is to equip their child, to fully furnish them with what? What they need to succeed. What they, there's nothing more frustrating to a child to just be put out with no knowledge of what do I need to do. Right? I mean... I don't know if, 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 if you were this way, but, but do you remember when you thought bank accounts were bottomless? <laughs> right? Amen. I told one of my kids one day, I, they said, well, you know, I, I, I'd like to buy this. And I said, well, I don't, I don't you know, uh, I don't have any cash. And they said, well, just write a check. <laughs> right? I mean, just write a check, but, you know. They take checks. Well, yes, son, there has to be money back of that check. Right? And at that time, there wasn't any. You understand? But here, here's the point. You, you know, we, we think about that, and it's funny, but there are people that, that grew up that way with no knowledge of what I'm supposed to do, no knowledge of how to handle my finances. No. So when that child got married, there were, they were ill-equipped to handle the pressure that's going to come. And so nine times out of ten, they got into financial issues, they got into financial problems because they didn't know how to handle their money. And they didn't know how to handle their money because mom and dad never took any time to furnish them, to equip them, to mature them. 
right? If you see a child that seems to have exceptionally have it all together, that's because mom and dad have taken time to make sure they have it all together. Amen. 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 Say, say it out loud. My pastor, My pastor is taking time to make sure, make sure I have it all together. I have it all together. Hallelujah. Do, do, do you understand that? Hallelujah. Amen. And, and, and I could go, go on and on with that, and, and maybe I should. You know, you know, I remember the first time I had to shop for groceries for myself. Talk about a paltry bit of groceries that came home. Right? I mean, it was, it was you know, what do you need other than Doritos? <laughs> Doritos and bean dip, man, we're set. <laughs> Open the cabinet and let there be chips. That's the key. Well, it was then, it's not now. But you, you understand? Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. But because a lot of parents, and I'm, I'm not telling you you've got to do this, but, you know, parents don't explain it. You need to plan your meals. Right. You need to determine week to week, what are you going to eat? What if, you know, plan it out. Then you'll know what to get when you go to the grocery store. If you send an immature child into the grocery store and you give them $20, and, which won't buy hardly anything nowadays, but you give them $20 and say, you know, hey, go get us some food. They're going to come out with some Oreos and, and <laughs> chocolate, right? <laughs> Amen. Can you just see that? Jeremy gives his girls $20 and says, y'all go buy us some food. They're going to come back with some corn dogs and slushy pops and doesn't make them bad, it's just they're immature. They're not qualified to make those decisions. Well, who helps them? We do. Right? We do. We help them. Amen. Do, do you see that? When, when a natural parent fails to adequately furnish and equip their child, they're setting that child up for failure in their life. They're setting them up to have detriments in their life. Well, on the other side of that, when you come to a church that fails to equip you correctly and spiritually mature you, that pastor is setting you up for failure. Mm, hallelujah. Everybody still loves pastor. Amen. Do you see that? Hallelujah. And, and, and I, I've counseled people over the years, and, and they would be having problems, and it kept coming up. Well, mom and dad never taught me. I was never taught. I wasn't trained. Whatever the case may be. And it used to frustrate me because, you know, I mean, I've learned over the years. I mean, I had to learn to administrate. I had to learn, right? I had to grow up and be compassionate. Right? Because people would come and say, well, nobody taught me. And my mind says, well, like, get over it. Learn. I mean, that was my counseling, you know. Forget it. Move on. Yeah, but nobody taught me. Well, I'm, get it now. Right? Amen. But then, it, then I begin to see something. I begin to see how, how, how hard it was for somebody to overcome something when they had not been equipped to overcome it. Amen. How, how is a young man supposed to know how to lead a family when he never had an example of how to lead a family? Ever how hard mom tries, she can't teach that young man to be a man. Are, are you following me? It, it takes a man to tell a boy how to be a man. Hallelujah. And so there's a level of immaturity that will be there because the mom's side is that nurturing, loving, compassionate, you know, you, you fell down, scraped your knee, come here, I'll kiss it, I'll make it all better. But that child needs the flip side of that as well. Come on, son, it's just a scraped knee. Nobody has ever died of a scraped knee. It's not that I'm not compassionate. That's, you understand what I mean by that? You don't ever tell a child, don't cry, and, right? Because it hurts. Cry. 
But, but here's the issue. At some point, you got to move on. you got to grow up. you got to mature and, and understand that especially when you have your own family and you have your own uh, uh, kids and wife to take care of, that you've got to shoulder the load and you've got to do what nobody else can do in your family and you just at times got to man up and do what you need to do. Right? They need that. If they're going to be perfectly furnished. Amen. Amen. I'm not talking about home and family living. It's good though. So God has placed believers in the church in order to be brought to a place of maturity. To be completely furnished for what God's called them to do. Now, what does that look like? Huh. The maturity, this maturity, is for the purpose of ministering to others. Not just to have a ministry. Notice verse 15 of Ephesians 4. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. That speaking the truth... It means that when you speak, it is enfolded in love. Enfolded in love. Hmm. So the result of being enfolded in love is what? That we grow up into the things of God. Notice that. Speaking the truth in love, being enfolded in love, we may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So ultimately, what we see here in the beginning is spiritual maturity is measured by love. Spiritual maturity is measured by love. Hallelujah. In in, in other words, my ability to speak words that are enfolded by love. Hallelujah. Amen. Notice Galatians 5. Amen. I love hearing little babies in the congregation. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, that's the next generation or the now generation, however you want to put it. Amen. We need, we need more babies because we're graduating our other babies. I saw Daryl and Yolanda's Ivy's graduating today. I remember when Ivy was born. Amen. I told Daryl today, I said, you about got them all graduated. And he just looked at me like that don't mean nothing. I mean, they're still at home. Amen. Wah, wah. Amen. Glory. Amen. But, 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 you see? Spiritual maturity is measured by love. Notice Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. These are the fruit of the reborn human spirit. Now, Many people will say, you know, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of the reborn human spirit. And notice something. The very first fruit of the reborn human spirit is love. The very first one. Now, there are people that will say, well, that, how is that so, why, why is that just incidental? No, it's not. There's nothing in the Bible that's just incidental. This is an inspired book. And the Holy Spirit put the first fruit of the reborn human spirit as love. How how, how do I know that? Why is that so important? Because that's the first thing that was injected into your spirit was the love of God. Right? Romans chapter 5 says that that, uh, 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 the love of God has been poured into our hearts or shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Well, how did you get born again? The Holy Spirit renewed your spirit. The Holy Spirit made you a new creature By grace, through faith. And the very first thing he did was fill your heart with the love of God. Amen. 
And, 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 and that's why I remember, remember when you first got saved and you got born again, you loved everybody. Right? Now, you still do. I'm not saying you don't. But, you, you know, I mean, people that you didn't like, you loved them. Amen. I remember Pastor Caldwell told when, when he got born again, he got saved. Of course, he was at the Grand Ole Opry, and he was talking about when, when he got uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. They were going to the Assembly of God Church, and he said he got, he got filled with the Holy Ghost. And he said, the love of God just flooded my heart. And he said, I was at the altar. And he said, there was another lady at the altar. And, uh, and he, he talked about her. And, 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 and uh, uh, she was an older lady. And he said, the love of God just overwhelmed me. And he said, I just hugged her and was just hugging her and crying. And he said, and I opened my eyes and, and I didn't know her. And, and, you know, and, but the point is, he was just overwhelmed with the love of God. Amen. Why? That, that love came rushing into your spirit. Because before you were born again, you had no idea about love. You couldn't. You had a natural human love, a phileo love, an eros love, but you didn't have an agape love. A lo a, right? A love that cannot end. A love that cannot be broken. You didn't have that in your life. So you were, you were therefore, it, it was impossible to live a completely mature life because it requires love. Amen. Hallelujah. This fruit is to mature. Every fruit that's mentioned after love is produced by love. Amen. Notice it says, for the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Then joy, then peace, then long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Well, you're not going to be joyful without love in your life. You're not going to have peace without love in your life. You cannot be long-suffering without love. Amen. You can't be gentle or good. You can't operate faith without love. Can't. You can't be meek or temperate without love. And you cannot, ha you cannot be a person that there's no law against without love. Because if you're not operating under the law of love, you have to, by, by default, operate under the law of works. And that's what Paul is saying. He's, he, he outlines the works of the flesh and then the fruit of the Spirit. And he's saying there's a law against these works of the flesh, but there is no law against the fruit of the Spirit. Hallelujah. And so, if I don't mature in love, I'll not mature in the fruit produced by love. If love isn't growing, meekness isn't growing. If love isn't growing, long-suffering isn't growing. If love isn't growing, faith isn't growing. Oh, hallelujah. Notice in verse 13 of chapter 5. Hallelujah. And we'll read through verse 17. For brethren, you have been called to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Notice... But by love, serve one another. So what will love cause me to want to do? Serve you. What do mature people do? Serve others. What do immature people do? Want to be served. Amen. <laughs> want to be recognized. Right? Amen. Think, 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 think about that. When, when you're furnishing a child, I, I was talking to uh, 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 Jeremy and Sarah tonight, and, and I was talking about Lily. And, you know, we're in that process with Lily. You know, when you're four, you know, we were walking the other day. Her and I were walking. There's some ponds down in the neighborhood we live in. There's some fishing ponds down there, and, and we were going down. And, 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 and she likes to run around the ponds and look at the turtles, and, and she wants to go fishing when I get back home. So, amen. But anyway... We were, we were walking, and she said something. I said, well, you're, you're really smart. And she said, Daddy, don't you know I know everything? <laughs> I 
Right? Amen. Well, we're in that, you know, you can't just say, well, no, you don't. <laughs> Live a few more years. And, 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 right? But, 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 but you know, she, you know they, they, they want to give their opinion. Their, what, right? And you don't want them to feel like what they have to say isn't valuable. But we'll be having a conversation and, you know, she would just get to the place where she would interrupt. And so we set a system in place. Okay, here's, here's the thing. We want to hear what you have to say, but if we're talking and you have something to say, raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, we'll know you got something to say. And when we're done, we'll call on you. Right? Well, she's getting better. <laughs> Well, what are we doing? Maturing, yeah. equipping, yeah. right? Nobody likes to be interrupted. Being interrupt, interrupting and being interrupted is rude. And you don't want to raise a rude child, right? Amen. Yeah. So, but if I don't mature in love, right? He says, he says here, by love, serve one another. And so a child growing up has to be taught it's not all about you. And you teach that in a nice way, but it's not all about you. Right? In a natural home, in a family home, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a natural home, nobody has the right to bring dissension and strife and anxiety into that home. Nobody in that home is so important that you're allowed to do that. Right? That's, that's got to be your mindset. If I'm going to raise it, because if I don't, then what's that child going to do? They're going to grow up and they're going to go to work. And when it doesn't go their way, they're going to throw a fit. And the boss is going to say, you're out of here. Because they don't have to put up with you. They got 15 more just like you waiting on a job. <laughs> right? Amen. So... I'm using that as an example to say, he says, when you begin to mature in love, you want to serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Now notice, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary to one another. You cannot do the things that you would. Walking in the spirit is walking in love. If I'm walking in the spirit, I'm walking in love. If I'm walking in love, I'm walking in the spirit. That's the sign of spiritual maturity. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Words of wisdom, words of, of knowledge, utterances, not evidence of spiritual maturity. They are not evidence of spiritual maturity. An anointing is not evidence of spiritual maturity. I've known some very anointed people that were very immature. Amen. And, and, and I've got to keep that in mind. Just because somebody hears from God doesn't mean they're mature. Watch their love walk. Watch how they interact with people. Are they touchy? Are they fretful? Are they insecure? That's evidence of a, of a deficit of love. Oh, glory. Right? I cannot be insecure. Listen, if I believe in the love my wife has for me, I can't be insecure in our relationship. Is that right? Amen. You know, people talk about jealousy. You know what jealousy is? Insecurity. That's all it is. And where's that insecurity stem from? You don't believe the love that your spouse has for you. Mm. I'm preaching better than you're letting on. Right? And, 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 and I've counseled people that, that were jealous. 
well, you know, uh, he just talks to other women. Well, okay, how is that a problem? I mean, define talk. Like on the phone? Because we got a problem there. I mean, if your husband's ringtone is to all the girls I've loved before, we got an issue. Right? <laughs> to all of the girls I've loved before. <laughs> Heather said. <laughs> <laughs> but, now, now, you understand? So, I would say define that. What do you mean? Well, you know, I mean, I mean, we come to church and, and, and he turns around and shakes hands with the woman behind him. Well, what did, I mean, did the pastor say turn around and greet somebody? Well, yeah, well, yeah, but it was more than that. What? Come on, it was a 30-second interaction. See, there's immaturity there. Insecurity is because of immaturity. See what I'm saying? And what cures that? Love. And believing the love that my spouse has for me. But in the body, believing the love that your brother or sister has for you. Believing the love that your pastor has for you. Which all stems from what? Believing the love that God has for you. Amen. Do, do you see that? And God, God can speak to somebody, and he, and he does. Thank God. He speaks to us. And, and it can be on a higher level. But that's not spiritual maturity. And I'll tell you why. Because a person born again 60 seconds can hear from God. Note, notice, notice, here, notice here in Acts 19. Love and the ability to walk in love is the evidence of spiritual maturity. Oh, hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, say, I'm growing. I'm growing. We're, all growing. We're all growing. Acts 19 and verse 6. Paul meets these men that have not received the Holy Ghost. They're operating under John's baptism. So that means they're, they're uh, according to what we see, they, they, they haven't made Jesus the Lord of their life. Verse uh, 6 says, And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Well, they just got saved. And they're prophesying. But you can't call them mature. Because what is prophecy? Divine utterance in a known tongue. How does that, how does that gift operate? As the Spirit wills. So who's responsible for it? The Spirit. I'm responsible for the manifestation as I yield. So what does that mean? That God will move through a vessel that's yielded, mature or immature. Amen. Well, can you believe that person acted like that? I mean, I mean, you know, they prophesy. Yeah. We'll read a scripture in a minute that will show you this even clearer. Hallelujah. Glory. But so, so, how is it, so how is it one day, you know, uh, your four-year-old will go in their room and, and, and they're in there for a few minutes and they, and they come out and they grab you and they say, come here and see this. And you go in the room and they walk through the door and they go, ta-da, and the room's clean. <laughs> Praise God. I'm not giving her the keys to my car. <laughs> right? Yeah, you clean the room one time. That, that does not mean spiritual or physical maturity. Right? Mature people clean their room all the time. Okay, I'm concerned about y'all. I... Uh, <laughs> No, I think better of you than that. Amen. Do you see that? And so I've had people say, but why would they act that way? I mean, they, they, they prophesy, they hear from God. That, that is not a sign of spiritual maturity. Yeah. 
Amen. It's something that every believer that will yield themselves can do. And that's, well, well, we'll go there in just a moment. But these men had just received the Holy Spirit and immediately after they're prophesying. They're not mature, they're filled. Not mature, they're filled. Th think, think about this. How is it that one minute Peter is yielding to the Holy Spirit, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and a few moments later yielding to the devil? Immaturity. Amen. How is it someone can give an utterance in tongues or interpret a tongue and fuss with their husband or wife on the way home? Immaturity. Right? Because they're not walking in the Spirit because they're not walking in love. And, and the quicker I understand that, I've watched, am, am I helping y'all? I've, I've watched ministers over the years that that uh, would justify some area in their life that was not godly because they were still anointed when they got in the pulpit. Amen. And you know, people would say, well, I, I would never do that. Well, I hope not. I mean, you're taught better than that. But here's, here's the thing. They would justify it because I'm still anointed. The Holy Spirit's still moving through me. Understand something. The anointing and the Holy Spirit moving through you is to edify the people. Not to make you somebody. My job is to keep my life right because I love God. And I love people. Amen. And, and if you ever confronted them about it, they would, they would get offended. Well, who do you think you are? Well, I mean, obviously to you, nobody. But that's not right. But they would justify it. See, love is the beginning of the character of Christ. And I have to develop my character at least at the same speed I'm developing my anointing. I probably should develop my character at a higher level. Be, be, because the anointing can operate through you when you have a character deficit. But you won't last. You won't last. Because that's not how it's designed. Amen. Now, you know, if you have an insecurity or something like that, I'm not saying that's a character issue. That's a maturity issue. I, I've just got to deal with that. Right? I've got to become secure in my love. Ma mature in, in the love God has for me. And you remind yourself, my brother, my sister, they love me. Right? That, that's always your mindset. They love me. Hallelujah. See, that's the mature response. Hmm. But why do they talk to me that way? Well, maybe they're immature. But Mama always said two wrongs don't make a right. Right? So, so two immature people, just because you have two immature people, it doesn't make one or the other right. Nobody is more right and nobody's more wrong. If they respond wrong to you and you respond back wrong, nobody's right there. Mm. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is important. Because where God is taking us as a fellowship and as a church, it's going to require spiritual maturity. Because there are things that God wants to pour out on His people and bring into our lives, and it requires a level of maturity. It requires me saying, I will do whatever God wants me to do in whatever capacity He wants me to do, and I will be mature and I'll walk it out. Because this is what God wants for me in this body. Amen. Amen. And, and, and there are things that God... That I, I, talk, I said about... Um, they clean the room, but I'm not going to give them the car keys. Why? There are things you can't give immature people. 
My daughter may get in my car and see the steering wheel, but that's no evidence that she knows how to use it. They may watch you push the ignition button and, and see that you shift and, and you know, you, you do something down there and you turn the wheel. Well, they, they, they might get in there and get the car started and do the same thing you did, but end up in the ditch. Because they're not mature. Doesn't make them bad. Just immature. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13. Notice this. Hallelujah. You know, this is something that I, I, I use the word wish. This is something that I wish I would have learned growing up in church. And I mean literally growing up in church. I, I, I'll be saved 47 years this year. I literally grew up in church. And I heard a lot about power. I heard a lot about anointing. I, I mean, we, we, we were tongue talkers. I mean, we just didn't know about tongues. We were tongue talkers. I mean, we had to be careful because a Shandai might sneak out, you know. We just in not natural conversation, oh, Shandai, you know, just didn't know. Good night, baby. I love Shandai. Unction, hit your wife. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, you had to watch it. But that, that's, that's what we expected when we come to church. We're going to talk in tongues. We're going to run. We're going to jump. We're going to have power. Right? And my daddy would say, and they all had tongues so long they could sit on the front porch and lick the skillet on the back. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Dan, that was worth coming to church for. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and you know what he was saying is they don't love one another. Amen. I mean, we had beehive hairdos, no makeup. The women didn't even shave their legs. Sister, am I lying? That's the truth. <laughs> Amen. And you can see there's no beehive on her. And shall nary be one either. Amen. Now, I don't know about the legs, so that's why I don't know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not saying. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But, but, but the point was we knew about power, we knew about manifestations. I mean, some, some, of the, some of the most bitter people would give tongues and interpretation of tongues. And, and even as a kid, you would think, well, that's a mean woman. That's, boy, that, <laughs> hallelujah. I, I mean it. If you saw them coming, you locked the door. Is it? There's, there was one lady in the church that we went to, and... I mean, she got upset with me. I was a grown man. And she got upset with me, and I thought, I need, I need, some, I need an usher. I need some help. <laughs> Amen. Her name was Barb. Barb. And, and she was the song leader. And boy, she'd get those hips rocking <laughs> and just talk about, talk about Pentecost. And, and, you know, if we are not charismatic, we're Pentecostal. And... Okay, I, I, we're Pentecostal. And she got me in the corner one night, upset with me about something. I thought, it's over. It's, I'm going to die in this corner. And nobody's going to know. She's, she, you know, she had, but you know, she would wave in the little, little, you, you understand? And I thought, I thought, she's, she's going to put me in a headlock and smother me. And no, nope, I'm going to die silently. <laughs> now that's an exaggeration. You understand? But, but that's how it was. And just speak in tongues. 
and then just be ugly and mean and run people off. If they didn't like you in that church, they just ran you off. Amen. Hallelujah. But we, we knew power and, 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 and we want to shout and we're going to do a Jericho march. <laughs> and ugly. Not just naturally, spiritually, just <laughs> ugly. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, 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 so we knew a lot about those kind of things. And, and you know, God did some things. God, God was merciful. God was gracious. God saved people. And, and there were people that were healed. Healed of cancer and, and healed of different things. But there was no move of God that could be sustained because people wouldn't grow up. God will visit our churches and God will visit your life and then I got to grow into that. If I want to sustain it, I got to grow into it. And so, in fact, <laughs> let's follow Barb over to 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> I mean, they'd say, going to be a meeting tonight. <laughs> And you're like, <laughs> and the more she did that, the harder they played the piano. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> I better get away from that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, but but you know there 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 it was it was just a lack of maturity. And 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 if you brought it up, if you talked about it, if you confronted it, it was it was a rage. It was it was don't you tell me and and, and all these things. And that's not how love operates. That's, that's not how spiritually mature people operate. It's important. And, uh, and, and there were people that were run out of that church that needed God. And needed help. Amen. I remember, and, and sister, I'm, I'm going to tell on us. But uh, uh, we were... Uh, we were, we, we, when, we, when we moved here, uh, Michelle and I moved here, my sister and her family moved here, and uh, we were all looking for a church. And, uh, you know, they're not as easy to find as you think. And so we're looking for a church, and uh, so we, we found this little Pentecostal church, and we were going to it. And, uh, and uh, uh, one Sunday we went, and we all met, and we met their family, and, and, and we all went to church. And... Uh, uh, my sister had a dress on that had a, I don't know, a split about up to the knee. I guess modest, I mean, you know. And, and we went in, and they, they knew she played the piano, and they wanted her to play the piano. Well, listen, this is Pastor Angela Meek and Mild. <laughs> but listen, this is one of the boldest women I know. All right, and, and I mean... It doesn't bother her to just do what needs to be done. And so they asked her to play the piano. She didn't think about a split in the skirt. We're in a Pentecostal church. I mean, bun wearing <laughs> Pentecostal. So she just goes up to the piano. And my Lord, you could feel the air come out of the room. <gasps> Guess what the preacher preached on? Splits in skirts. People got a split, and he said up to here. Well, my God, man. I mean, you lied, number one. (laughs) 
And then, and, and, and then he said, I got some help for you. I, I got a string of safety pins in my office. We'll just safety pin you up. I thought, you know, I'm sitting there, and here's what I'm thinking. You have no idea the deaf ears that your words are falling on because she doesn't care. <laughs> Don't care. Not listening. Amen. Well, well, we, you know, church was over and, and, and we had to leave and, and Pastor Michelle was getting up and she caught her foot on the pew and, and almost fell down. And, uh, and so, but she got up and, and we got out of there. Well, listen, then the pastor calls me at home. And he's like, well, I wanted to call and check on Michelle. They told me she fell on the way out. And I said, well, you know, she kind of tripped, but she's okay. And he said, well, just want to make sure y'all are all right. Make sure that your family's okay. Everybody doing okay. And I thought, you just hammered us from the pulpit. See, that's not love. Lo love doesn't call after the fact and try to fix something that you know you did. Not apologize. Are you following me? That's, that's immaturity. And so what, what was the climate of that church? Immaturity. Why? Because the pastor was immature. If, as a pastor, you don't deal with things publicly that require private instruction. Because you care about the person. You care about the person. Yeah, but I, but I know something. Just because you know it doesn't mean you're supposed to say it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Do, do you see that? I, I, I had a couple one time coming to the church. And, and they still come to the church. Well, I'll tell you who it is. Rusty and Amy. I've, I've talked about it before and testified publicly about it and with them in, in the midst. They, they, they showed their love for God because they, you know, they came here and God saved them. And you know what God saved Rusty from. And, and, and the thing a lot of people don't know is, is Amy's testimony, how, what, where God brought her from and the shame and the guilt and, the, and all the, the insecurities. And, you know, they, they came in and got saved and full of the Holy Ghost and they just want to get involved in everything. So they sign up for the ushers. They sign up for the greeters. They're not married. And they're living together. People say, what'd you do? I didn't get, I didn't get up in the church and say, now these two, <laughs> Leon and Amy, right? No, 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 no. We, 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 we met with them and said, look, we want you to be involved in the church and we want you to use your gifts for the church. And I know y'all are going to get married and, and, you know, it's in our policies that, that you need to be married. You know, e either you need to be married or you need to, you know, whatever, be living separately or whatever. Because, because we want to use your, you, man, they, they just said, we understand perfectly. And they just put it on hold. They got married and came back and started working. Why, why is that important? Because, because it's always better to keep a friend than win a fight. Always, always better to keep a friend than win a fight. That doesn't mean that there's things you don't have to correct or that you don't have to deal with. You may have to, but you deal with it from a spirit of love. If somebody loves you, they trust you. If you love me, you'll trust me. And if I've ever got to talk to you about something in your life, you know that I'm talking to you because I love you. And you trust me. Does that make sense? Amen. And, 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 but there were people that, that were run out of that church that needed the love of God. They needed the mercy of God. But because of immature people, they didn't get the help they needed. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, have not charity, I am a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy, I understand all mystery, all knowledge, I have all faith, I could remove all mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. Though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, give my body to be burned, have not charity, it profits me nothing. Paul is talking about here, number one, speaking in tongues. Tongues of men and angels. Talking about speaking in tongues, the gift of tongues. Secondly, he's talking about the gift of prophecy. 
Thirdly, the word of wisdom. Fourthly, the word of knowledge. And fifthly, the gift of faith, special faith. And notice what he says. The point is not the operating of these gifts, but the reason for the operation of these gifts. Because we love people. So he says, at, behind all of these gifts, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, notice, and I have not charity, I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You know what that means? It literally means this in the Greek. You're just annoying. Right? You know, you know we all enjoy Brother Kevin's drum playing, right? Is that right? How about this? What if that's all he did? Just annoying. Right? Just annoying. That's what this is saying. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and I don't have love, I'm annoying. Why? Because I'm speaking in tongues, I'm giving an utterance in tongues, and then I'm, I'm touchy, I'm belligerent, I'm fretful, I'm insecure, right? I'm offended. That's annoying. It's, it's annoying to see somebody operating the gifts of the Spirit and then walk in the flesh. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm-mm-mm. He says, I can have the gift of prophecy. That's the, the interpretation of the divine will and purpose of God. I can prophesy. Amen. I can understand all mysteries. I can have the word of wisdom operating in my life. I can understand all knowledge. I can have the word of knowledge operating in my life. I can have the gift of faith so that I can remove mountain after mountain. And if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Why? Because love is what brings solidity. Love is what brings, uh, we, we could say it this way, love is what gives depth to you. Love is what gives you a bottom. You understand? With, without love, I'm thin. I'm light. Because love is what, is what weighs me down. Love's what anchors me. Amen. And when you operate in these gifts because you love people, because your desire is to help people, then you're operating in them from a mature standpoint. And you don't think that just operating in them makes you mature. Because Paul just said, I can do all these things, and if I don't have love, and, of course, then he, he outlines love, and we're not going to take the time to do that tonight. But, but you think about that. Amen. How do, how do people love? How, how's their love walk? I've known pastors before that they were not the best preachers. They were, they were not the best administrators. They weren't even the most anointed people I knew. But, boy, they loved people, and they had to go in church because they loved people. God honors love. God honors love. When he can find someone that will walk in love, he'll honor that person. One, one, of the greatest, one of the greatest pieces of advice my pastor ever gave me was you stay above the fray and walk in love. Jesus did not say, blessed are those that want their own way. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Amen. Amen. So, so what's my job? To promote peace, to promote love. That, that, that's, that's the sign of spiritual maturity. Amen. How, how I deal with conflict. Think, think about that for a moment. How, how, I, how I deal with things. You know, we, we got to mature past this, this mindset of, of why, why'd they look at me that way? Why, you know... Why'd they say that? What, what, why'd they do this? Or, or I was going to shake their hand. They, would, they, they, didn't, you know, they wouldn't shake my hand. Wouldn't or didn't. 
Maybe they didn't know, right? You should have just went, <laughs> shook your own hand. Let it go, right? But you understand that? Because if I don't deal with that, I'll try to wrap some of this up with this. When God starts moving, the devil starts acting. Because he wants to get involved in things and mess them up. And the devil is in the spirit realm. And he sees things that are coming. He don't know what it is, but he sees it in the spirit. And so what he'll do is he'll try to get involved and get people at odds with one another or questioning one another or questioning people's motives. Why'd they look at me like that? Why'd they say that? Why didn't they shake my hand? How come they acted like that? Well, they don't talk to me no more, ever. They never, they don't ever talk to you anymore. Right? You, 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 right? That, that, that's like the child. You know, you're stopped for two minutes in traffic, and they're like, it's taking forever. <laughs> right? And I mean, they're in the back seat. They got the air conditioner blowing on them. They got a Kindle. They got, you know, pop. They whatever, right? I'm the one. <laughs> Kindle girl. <laughs> right? That, that's, that's immature. It's, it's not bad. They're not bad. They're just immature. Amen. And, and, and when I begin to recognize that, and, and the more anointing that God wants to pour into a ministry or on the ministers in that ministry, the, the higher level of love they've got to walk in because that's what keeps you anchored. When you walk heavily in love, that anointing cannot take you someplace your character won't keep you. Because love is the beginning of the character of Christ. Amen. Look, look at uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and 10. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. One translation says, but when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. Now, now what does that mean? When you are perfected in love, the partial will fade away. In other words, that which is perfect is love. And love is greater than the gifts. Why? Because God is love. Love is greater than the gifts. If you can love people and walk in love, it doesn't matter if you ever give an utterance in tongues, or you ever prophesy, or you ever have a word of wisdom. You're fulfilling the royal law. You're, you're walking in love. Now, but here, listen to me. The more you walk in love, the more manifestations of those things you'll see. It's inevitable. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, when you, when you listen and read after Brother Hagin uh, regularly, I, 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 for years, that Brother Hagin's who I listen to. People say, well, who do you listen to? Brother Hagin. That's who I listen to. Now, I listen to other people, but... Not like I listen to Brother Hagin. And, uh, you know, I, I've had people say, well, you sure mention him a lot. Well, um, if uh, Charles Stanley had changed my life like Brother Hagin, I would mention Charles Stanley a lot. He's a wonderful minister, but that, that's who God brought the word to me through. And so, but if you read after him and listen to him long enough, you will find that his great aim and quest in life was walking in love. At his home-going service, person after person made the statement that, you know, Brother Hagin's known as a man of faith, but I knew him as a great man of love. And he said over and over again that he believed what had kept him well and whole all those years after being raised off his deathbed was his decision to walk in love. And that's why he would not get into odds with anybody. Anybody. He could be direct, but he wouldn't get in odds with anybody. Hallelujah. Because he said, a step out of love is a step away from God. 
And that, that's important. And, and uh, as I'm wrapping this up, you know, we're not just talking about love in, in the sense of not being offended. I, I, I want to say this very nice. Folks, <laughs> offense is just immaturity. You know, adults don't get offended. Kids get offended. Amen. And so, so we want to grow past that. And the way we do that, notice 1 John 4 and 8. And this will be our last scripture. 1 John 4 and 8. Uh, it tells us what I just said there in that last statement. It says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, of course, when that word know there... Uh, now, it's to be intimate with or to have knowledge of. So, more than anything, he's saying the person that doesn't love does not have a mature knowledge of God because God is love. Could, Brother Buzz, could you show me that in the Amplified Bible, please? This, this is something to see. He that does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know Him, for God is love. So the more you become acquainted with God, and the more you know God, the more you walk in love. The more you know love. Amen. And so I have found over the years that when you're, you're talking about leadership and and leaders and uh, uh, people with calls of God on their life what you're looking for is is that fruit of love being cultivated because you got to deal with people and if you're going to deal with people you got to love them amen and if you come in and somebody's having a bad day you can't start questioning why they they treated you that way they're having a bad day What they mean by that? Nothing. There's got to be the response in your mind and in your heart. Nothing. They didn't mean nothing by that. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You know, I've walked by people in the hallway before, and I'd say, good morning, how are you? And they're like, oh. People say, well, what do you do about that? What do you mean, what do I do about that? It means nothing. I said, it means nothing. But immaturity says, well, they got something against me. But they didn't even say anything. They growled. They didn't say anything. You don't, you don't know if they've got something against you. They kind of grunted. You know? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. And, and let me finish with this. If you're going to interpret the moving and the leading of the Spirit in your life, it's, it's got to be preceded by love. Has to be. Be, be, be. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that transported the love of God into your heart. He is the agent of God's love. Amen. And, and, and when I come to recognize that, amen, then God can flow through me on a higher level. Because I'm not trying to be heard I'm not, I'm not trying to make sure that people know I'm anointed. I'm trying to make sure that people know I love them. And when people know you love them, then the door's open for you to speak to them. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's so vital. Amen. And when we walk in love and we operate in love towards each other, then the, 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 the next thing is there'll be an increase of anointing. There'll be an increase of the presence of God. There'll be an increase of the move of the Spirit. Amen. And everybody is on the same page, and we just want what God wants, and we want to love each other, and we want to be mature in the things of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and you'll start finding, you'll start finding as you walk these things out, that, that things that used to bother you don't bother you no more. Right? Those insecurities start going away. 
How many would like that? Those, those little things that try to crop up. You know, I want them gone. Well, 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 the way, you know, it's not laying hands on you and casting out the demon of insecurity. <laughs> right? Would God it was that easy? You know, that'd be great. We just have a casting out service. <laughs> but love has to be cultivated. It has to be walked out. You've got to talk to yourself about love. Right? Amen. Hallelujah. And, and you'll never get to the place where you don't have to use it. I remember one time I was with, um, I was with Pastor Caldwell. We were in Fullerton, California a couple years ago. And we were there, a, a pastor named Art Aragon at his church. And, and uh, we were on the, on the elevator. And we had made, we had made the trip alone. Uh, Miss Jeannie didn't come. And, and uh, so we're on the elevator. And we were talking about things. And we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, keeping step with God and, 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 you know, making sure that you're in line with what he wants. And, you know, I made the statement. I said, well, you know, it's like Brother Hagin says. I said that, you know, it's, a, it's better to be a little behind God than too far out in front. And uh, uh, the, we came to the bottom floor and the, the door opened. And he just looked at me and said, unless you're too far behind, then he'll just get somebody else. Well, you know, that was kind of abrupt. You know, kind of like I wanted to go, oh, you got me in the liver, you know, <laughs> but, but you know what? I thought, now, wait a minute, hang on, wait a minute. You know, now he wasn't ugly and mad about it, but it was just kind of like, you know, now if I'm touchy, if I'm insecure, I'm going to think, hey, I paid my own way. Right? Hallelujah. I'm, I'm going to be working on your product. I'm going to be taking care of your stuff. And you just gave me a liver shot. Right? But, but I, I, I recognized something years ago. I'm getting much more out of that relationship. Right? Than I'm giving. And he loved me enough to help me. Amen. I'm, I was standing in. I'm a pastor. I've got two churches. I've been in the full-time ministry 23 years this year. I've been saved 47 years. November. And I'm standing in the foyer in Jim Ames Church in Dodge City, Kansas, Abundant Life Family Worship Center. And I'm standing in the foyer and my pastor comes in and corrects me in front of the pastor. I got two churches. <laughs> I'm on TV. <laughs> right? Now, it wasn't ugly and, and mean, but it was correction. Love recognizes. There's times I'm going to be corrected. And it doesn't matter if I'm corrected in front of somebody or if I'm corrected in private. I'm going to receive the correction because that's what is best. The more teachable and correctable you are, the more of a wide conduit you are for God to use you. Amen. Because if I'm teachable and correctable, love is flowing through me. And love will flow through me to the people. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But see, you're teachable. Amen. You're correctable. Amen. You're maturing. You're people of love. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. That's a good time to look at your neighbor and say, you know what? I love you. <laughs> Hallelujah. How come Jeremy looked past Sarah to... to, to uh, <laughs> Okay, all right, hallelujah. <laughs> Don't get offended. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Watch out. You love me? I love you too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In God good. Well, let's stand up. Did you receive anything out of that tonight? I believe God. I believe God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, glory. Oh, thank you, Father. 
Mm-mm-mm. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I'm just checking my spirit to make sure there's nothing else. Thank you, Father. Glory be to God. There's more to come. And more to come and more to come. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Just say this out loud. Say, Lord, Lord I make love I make my great quest. My great quest. I, desire I desire to mature into you. To, mature to walk in all you have for me. To be a body, body. holy filled filled. and flooded with God himself in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, don't forget, of course, Wednesday night, uh, we'll be ministering the word Wednesday night united. Amen. And then, of course, Sunday morning, Pastor Michelle will be with you on Sunday night. And uh, God's good to us. Amen. Well, come on, say it with me tonight. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this message. We would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or want to share how this message has helped you, send us an email at main at buildfaith.net. This message and many more materials are available to you free of charge, can be found at buildfaith.net or at any of our location media stores. As always, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.